Chapter 1. Miracle Orphan, 1867, London. A man in a bowler hat walked into Larkin's hospital room and gave her a bright smile. Behind him, a porter wheeled in three battered trunks. The top trunk was so crushed, the contents could be seen through the gaping seams. Good morning, Miss Burke, the man said. You're a very lucky girl. The statement was so absurd considering the circumstances. No ready response sprang to her lips. My name is Mr Club, and I work for the train company. He gestured towards the trunks. We took the trouble to recover your family's luggage from the accident site. Oh, and we recovered these personal items from your parents. He produced her father's wallet, pocket watch and fob, and her mother's locket. Larkin put out her hand for the items, noticing immediately the dark brown bloodstains on the back of the watch, where her father's initials were engraved. The train company has generously agreed to cover your hospital bills. In addition, we've contacted the newspaper to see if they would start a memorial fund on your behalf. They've dubbed you the Miracle Orphan, you know. It's likely a great many people will be so moved by your plight. The fund will grow quickly. Mr Club lifted his hat. Take care, Miss Burke. He left, along with the porter, who slid her a curious glance on his way out. When she was alone, Larkin had enough presence of mind to open her father's wallet to see how much money was inside. It was empty, unfortunately, a condition she was certain had occurred somewhere between the train wreckage and the hospital. She bit her lip with worry. The cuts on her back had begun to heal, and the hospital said she must leave that afternoon. How was she to get home without funds? And even if she could get home, how could a fourteen-year-old live alone without parents or a guardian? Overwhelming sorrow and loneliness dissolved her self-control, and she let out a keening moan. Her body was racked with grief, and the cuts on her lower back ached and itched. The doctors had failed to remove all the shards the first time they tended to her injuries, but she was now at least glass-free. A nurse bustled into the room and stood with her arms akimbo. "'Stop your crying, lass. You're not the only child ever to be orphaned. You can be sure a lot of children lost one or both parents on that death train.' When Larkin's crying failed to ease, the nurse made a sound of frustration. "'I see your luggage has arrived.' The police are coming to escort you to the orphanage, so unless you want to wear that hospital gown out in public, I suggest you change your clothes. Fear of the unknown ate at her centre and robbed her skin of its warmth. Larkin's fingers felt frozen as the policeman ushered her into Mrs Platt's office and left without a backward glance. The matron eyed her up and down, handed her a uniform and gestured to a screen in the corner. A change into this, and I'll lock up your dress with your luggage. I'd like to wear my mother's locket. Suit yourself, but it won't be my fault if it gets stolen. Five minutes later, Mrs Platt escorted her down a long hallway and into a girl's dormitory. The room was large and open, with beds jutting out from the walls like the ivory keys on a keyboard. When she passed through the phalanx of orphans, Larkin felt their hard, unblinking stares upon her. She'd seen stray curs before with friendlier eyes. The matron assigned her a bed, turned on her heel, and retraced her steps through the silent, identically dressed residence. As soon as the woman disappeared, boisterous conversations resumed. Unsure what else to do, Larkin sat on her bed and gazed at the floor. Nobody made any attempt to speak with her, but she could hear them whispering behind her back. Finally, a tall girl with large bones strolled over, followed by several of the others. So, you're the miracle orphan, huh? You're not better than any of us. A gulp. I never said I was. You're thinking it. I'm Drusilla. If you want to get along here, you'll stay on my right side. With a sneer, the girl strode off with her friends, surrounded by nervous titters and giggles. For Larkin, falling asleep that night was a struggle, and staying asleep impossible. After she'd wakened from her nightmare for the third time, Drusilla hauled her out of bed, dragged her to the infirmary, and threw her inside. Sleep in there from now on, 
and leave us in peace.'